we'll look at his life and ministry and, and beyond. But we have been considering the shadow of Christ, and as we have considered the shadow of Christ, we have been considering the deity and manhood of Christ. We've been considering the fact that he would be the Redeemer, and um, that goes back to what we talked about in Sunday school as well, that there was, all the way back in time of Job, an indicator that Jesus would be the, the Redeemer, that God would come and redeem his people. Uh, but we saw as well that he would be the sacrifice for our sin and our Passover lamb, and that he would offer himself as a sacrifice in the order as, of a priest of Melchizedek, that he could offer that sacrifice because he would be in the, the order of the priest of Melchizedek. And so you can see the nine different messages that we've had so far with the, the um, kind of a picture that represents it last week, looking at Christ being our, our Passover, our Passover lamb. Today we want to continue on in the, the, that event of Israel being delivered from the land of Egypt, which is referred to as the Passover, uh, but also is referred to as the, the Exodus. And that's why um, the book is titled The Exodus, because it's talking about the, the way out of. It's, Exodus is really a Greek word. It's kind of interesting. It's from ek hados, which means the way out of is what it means. And so um, God gave them the way out of Egypt, just as he's given us the way out of what? Sin. And so what's the way out of sin? The blood of Jesus. Okay. And so the way out of Egypt was the blood of the Lamb, just as it is for us today. But we want to look at Jesus being the light of the world. And this morning, um, just a little bit ago, we had the the Bible reading from the book of Exodus, and we'll be looking back at that passage a lot. Uh, But in that passage, just as a reflection right now, we saw that when God was leading Israel out of Egypt, um, that he didn't lead them the the most direct route. He actually led them to the south, up to the, the, uh, the Red Sea. And he said, you know, unless they go into the land immediately and they're faced with war and, and they turn back to Egypt because they're not ready for war, I'm going to lead them this way. So he leads them down into the Red Sea Passage. And as they're down at the Red Sea, and, you know, they've got this big, wide expanse in front of them, and they're, they're camping out, what happens? The Egyptians show up, okay? They came for the picnic, right? No. They came, how? How did they, how did they arrive? With what? Chariots. Now, you've got to understand that the Egyptian army right now was the world empire. It's like the United States Special Forces showing up at your door. Okay? It's, the world understands that the U.S. right now has the prowess in military matters. Okay? Back at that time, Egypt was the world empire. They were the world power. When, when nations saw the dust of the chariots coming. It was not a good sign. Okay? That's even if you were in a what? A city with big walls. What what was Israel in? The wilderness. They were in a camp. They were in a makeshift camp. Okay? Not like they'd been out camping before. Remember, this is, they just went out. They just fled from Egypt, and now they're out there, and they're getting things together. There's a lot of disorganization, right? And so a lot of things that are going on there, and on the door comes the world's greatest army with their chariots. Okay? And much fear was struck into the heart of the Israelites. And they said what? You did this on purpose to kill us. Wouldn't have been better if we would have stayed in, in, in Egypt and we would have served the Egyptians. But, oh no, you've got to bring us out of the wilderness because there wasn't enough grave space in Egypt. So we're going to come out here so we can all die. And, and, and said, no, no, that's not the case at all. Rather, you're going to see the deliverance of, you're going to see the deliverance of God. And as you can see in the picture, then, how did God do that deliverance? Well, it was through that, that pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. And so, that God came back, in fact, I'm going to go back to that previous one here. And, uh, and you can see that the, the picture is, is, is wrong. Does anybody know anything wrong about that picture? What's wrong, Aaron? Well, no, not the next picture, but this picture right here. Huh? The pyramids, right. The pyramids aren't there by the Red Sea. Okay? So the artist, the, the artist kind of put that in there. You've got the, 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 the sea there, but the, the pyramids weren't going to be right next to the Red Sea. So, um, so the idea, though, is just to, to bring the, the guy the, together that they are where? In Egypt. Okay? And so, but you've got this pillar of, of fire, then, that comes in, and where does the pillar of fire go? 
between them. Turn if you're if you're if you're not there yet, turn to Exodus 14, okay, and drop down to verse 19. We're going to come back to this, okay, later. But just as the we we position where we are here, and it says the angel of God, the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So apparently, when they started leaving out of the land, what happened? There was all of a sudden this what? This pillar. We're not told about it before, but now all of a sudden we're told that this pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, goes from before them, and it goes behind them. We'll talk about this in a moment with the protection of God. So we know that this, they have this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, and yes, Aaron, you're right, they didn't have the tabernacle yet, but they are going to have it in the wilderness, okay? And the pillar, that pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud is going to stay with them. And so with that, let's turn, because we want to see a little bit more about this. Turn to Numbers chapter 9. We'll come back to Exodus in a moment. But let's look at Numbers chapter 9, because this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire did stay with them this entire journey, okay? And as we're going to see, this pillar of fire provided them direction and protection, okay? And so, clearly, they came out of the land, and they're, they're following the direction of the Lord. We don't know exactly how. We're not told that. All we're told is that this pillar moves from before them to go behind them. So it must have been running, in, or running, if you would, moving in front of them. In Numbers 9, we're given a little bit more indicator about what the purpose of this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire is. And in Numbers chapter 9, beginning at verse 15, we read, Now on the day that the tabernacle was raised up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of testimony. From evening until morning, it was above the tabernacle like the appearance of a fire. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, after that, the children of Israel would do what? They would journey. They would move. And in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Israel would pitch their tents. At the commandment of Yahweh, the children of Israel would journey. At the command of Yahweh, they would camp. As long as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle, they remained encamped. Even when the cloud continued long, many days above the tabernacle, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord, and they did not journey. So it was, when the cloud was above the tabernacle a few days, according to the command of the Lord, they would remain encamped. And according to the command of the Lord, they would journey. So it was, when the cloud remained only from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, that they would journey, whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud was taken up, they would journey. Whether it was two days, a month, or a year, that the cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. At the command of the Lord, they remained encamped, and at the command of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord and by the hand of Moses. Now, there was a lot of redundancy in what I read, wasn't there? When God says something, it's important. But have you ever talked to your kids and said it numerous times? So they would what? They'd get it? Well, God is speaking redundantly. Why do you think so? So we'd get it. All right, so what did you just get? They obey completely. Okay. There's a little bit more there. God loved them. Okay. We're being generic here. Give me specifics. What happened? They waited. Okay. You're still giving me specifics. Give me a generality. Good. Okay. They, they followed the cloud. They followed the pillar. And they, when the, when the, according to schedule, God was in what? He's in charge. When God said move, they what? They moved. When God says stop, they what? They stop. When God says stay, they stayed. They were like a bunch of dogs. Okay? I don't mean to be rude. Okay? But isn't that what you take, you, you send your, 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 your pet to the, the obedience training schools for? Yeah? Because you want them to do what? You say stay, you want them to do what? You want them to stay. Right. Fran? Ah, good. Yes, and throughout the day, you're going to what? Because he could be, God could say, it's time what? To jump now. Okay? And so God was the one who was in charge of jumping. Okay? Those of you who are in Signal Corps, um, probably years past, I'm sure they still do it now, but probably not as much, but we had the term called a what? A jump. And if you had orders from above, it told you you were going to jump, and they gave you the what? The coordinates. You did what? 
You jumped. You, you prepped and you jumped. Now, what you should have done the first thing, though, was what? You should have authenticated the message to make sure that it really came from higher up. I, when I was in the reserves, I got to be that guy that did the test on people, and I would, in the middle of the night, tell them to jump. And then I would chew them out the next day for jumping because no, I didn't give them the orders to move. And so, anyways, because they never authenticated, you know, because you're used to it. Well, they said it was you, sir. I said, I was sleeping last night. I said, did anybody authenticate the message? Did you make sure that it was from God, in a sense? Okay, bring this back into, you get it? The only time they moved was when? God said, move. I mean, there could have been leaders who felt like they would spend too much time in the camp. They needed to what? They needed to move. But what did they do? They said no. Because they were to move when God moved. Period. Do you see the application for us as a body? I mean, I just, I just did up the, the numbers. I don't like taking numbers. I don't like looking at numbers. I try to ignore all that. But because, the, I don't, the, not the book of numbers, but yeah. Um, the numbers in the church. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like tracking numbers so much. Um, but because today's the business meeting and stuff, and um, I, I made up a listing of you know, those who are covenant members, uh, committed members, those who have committed and have moved on, and then those who are attending. And with, with all that, the ones who are attending right now, we have 72. Potentially, they could be here at any time. Okay? We have 70 blue chairs. You get it? So if everybody showed up, we have too many the blue chairs. Do you remember a month ago at, at, at our chili cook-off day? Do you remember what happened? We even had one, one uh, visiting family that was with us. We had lots of folding chairs up, okay? And so, anyways, so there is, then within me, this, this thing I'm looking out saying what? Wow, we potentially need what? More pasture land, <laughs> right? You know, we, we need to, but God said, move when I move. And God said, move where I send you. Just because the pillar got up and started moving, it didn't give them the right to do what? Go wherever they wanted to go. In hope that what? The pillar was going to follow them. How many times we say, God, can you, uh, can you bless this endeavor? We didn't wait to find out whether God wanted us to do it. We just went and did it. And then we want God to do what? To, he wants, yeah, we want him to join us. We want him to move with us. But God said, no, no, you don't get it. When I move, you move. And where I go, you go. But so many times, we want to go before he goes, and we want to do what we want to do. And God says it doesn't work that way. If it works that way, you're going to have problems. Well, the Word of God is the same way. So in my life, you should ask the question, well, then how do I know that? I mean, wouldn't it have been nice to be Israel? Friend, you wake up in the morning, and you do what? You look to see if there's a pillow there, right? <laughs> so what's the pillow doing today? You know. So I'm going to look, and I'm going to see where God wants me to go. What's the will of God for my life today? Well, clearly it's the, to rest. God wants me to chill out today. He wants me to go into the, land, uh, to, the, to, the, to the camp. He wants me to find quail. He wants me to get the manna. We're going to live. We're going to enjoy. Or I look out and I say, whoa, wait a second. What? The pillar's moving. Clearly the will of God in my life is to do what today? Pack up. <laughs> right, pack first of all. Pack up. That's exactly right. He's thinking like a wife. That's a good job. Thank you. Is to pack up. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm supposed to pack everything up. And then we're supposed to what? Follow. Move out. Follow. And then whenever the, 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 the pillar stops, what's supposed to happen? We're supposed to, to, to set up camp again. Well, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be nice if you could do that in the morning? You, you wake up and there's a pillar of cloud sitting in your backyard. And it kind of lets you know, today's a day of rest. Just hang out. Or all of a sudden you see it starting to move and you go, oh man, all right. You jump in the truck, you jump in the car and it leads you to work. <laughs> Well, I guess I'm supposed to work today, you know. You get, I mean, it just kind of makes things easier, doesn't, doesn't it, sometimes? You know, you know, am I supposed to go to the ball game today? You know, am I supposed to, you know, and it goes there, you know, da 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 Well, it doesn't work that way. Well, God gives us his word. Psalm 119, 105. Does anybody have that memorized? Say it again. No, that's not 105. Psalm 119, 105. Good. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a... Yeah, a lamp on my feet and light on my path. Yes, that word is a lamp on my feet and light on my path. Psalm 119, um, 81. Does anybody know that one? 
The entrance. Entrance of thy word giveth, you know, look it up, make sure I, I give you the right reference. The entrance of thy word giveth light, they giveth meaning unto the simple. Psalm 119, verse, verse 11. Uh, now you can't remember it, huh? <laughs> Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. How many of you woke up this morning and said, I really want to sin? You won't admit it here right now, okay? <laughs> no, I won't admit that right now. But honestly, you know, would we really say that? Oh, I really want to sin. No, most of us say we don't want to sin. So God says, here's how you can, I can lead you so that you don't sin. Well, how is it? Help me out. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Okay, so we quoted it. What does it mean? Flesh it out for me. How, how can I know God's will in my life so that I don't sin? When, when you're tempted to the Holy Spirit, that doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit in that passage. No, tell me that verse, though. Tell me that verse. What does that verse say? How, how can I know how can I know God's will so that I don't have to sin? Fran? Well, well, first of all, the hiding part is that it's more treasure. I, I, I value it. So it's like the value that I'm placing in my heart. So when that value comes up against another value, that value... Okay, well, that's good. So when, when it values in my heart and it comes up against another value, it doesn't do that. So how do I get it there? I had finally one right answer. I memorize it. I hid it in my heart. I put it in my heart. I have got to what? I've got to put God's word in my heart. Now this is, I mean, I know this is kind of simple, but pretty basic. That means that I'm spending time reading God's word and memorizing God's word. Okay? That's why we have that, that memory verse of the month thing. Okay? Not that I'm going to, you know, we give a quiz to everybody, make sure, you know, we, we're going to grade you and make sure that you're memorizing it. But is this an encouragement to you to place it in front of you that memorizing God's word is that important? Because you should be able to say that, from 1 John chapter 1, since we've already memorized that, right? That you can jump right in the middle of that and you can say that, um, now I'm going to mess this up if, if, we have, if we confess our sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you say that you have not sinned, you make God a liar and his word is not in you. Okay? So automatically, I, t- I know when I'm walking through my day that I'm what? I'm wedged between what? Sin. Sin? I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the biblical Oreo, if you would, okay? I mean, you got sin on either side, and you got confession of your sin in the middle. And God's what? He's going to be just to forgive us. Okay? But you're never going to confess it if what? You don't recognize that you're a sinner. But God took twice to tell me that I'm a sinner, once to tell me I can confess it. We want to spend more time worrying about the confession and not worrying about the, the understanding that the confession is all about sin. But I know that because I've hidden God's word in my, my heart, right? And so verse 9 of chapter, or Psalm 119 comes two verses before verse 11, just in case it was a math problem. But, um, so two verses before, God said, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, through David. He says through David in verse 9, he says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Okay? And so how shall a young man cleanse his way? Following the cloud. You get it? Following the cloud. Get it in God's word. God still leads. God still guides. But sometimes we're looking more to the world for guidance and direction than we are to God. What does God have to say about finances? I mean, you know, because honestly, a lot of times directions, we're, 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 we're looking for help with our finances. Does God have anything to say about finances? Tell me something about finances from God's word. It doesn't have to be any particular. Just say anything from God's word. Good. Matthew 6. I was thinking that in my brain. Okay. That the priority is to lay up your treasures in heaven where the moth and the rust does not corrupt rather than laying them on, on earth where the moth and the rust are going to corrupt it. So when I, when I consider then my, the background of finances in the world, the reality is I need to realize that God's riches are more important than the world's riches. Okay, does anybody else have a, a, a passage? Good. I was going there as well. Okay, in the book of Proverbs, twice it says, don't be a co-signer of somebody's loan. That's what it means. Okay, don't put security up for somebody else's loan. Why then should you do that and they come and take your bed when the other guy doesn't pay? Okay, don't co-sign somebody else's loan. That's biblical. Do you get it? We could go on and on, but there's a lot in the Word of God regarding 
finances. Jesus said you have to be able to use the unrighteous mammon of the world if you're ever going to be able to use the righteous stuff of God, of the heaven. Okay? And so if we don't know how to operate in the world financially according to a biblical standard, we're never going to understand how we're supposed to be operating in, in the spiritual kingdom of God. And you get all that from reading God's word and memorizing it, hiding it in your heart, so that you can be like the man that is planted by the rivers of water, like the tree that's planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit, its leaves shall not wither, whatsoever you do shall prosper. Do you get it? We want to be that prosperous person. So, the pillar of cloud and fire provided direction to the children of Israel, just as the word of God provides direction to us today. Secondly, we saw... Hmm. It provides protection. I, I thought. Give me a second. We're, we're having one of those. We, we talked about it this morning about what happens if you have a uh, technical difficulty. We're having technical difficulties. Yep. Okay. Somehow I know. I somehow I deleted a slide here. So, all right, so you'll have to work with me on my slide, okay? And you'll have to pretend, okay? And so the pillar of cloud and fire not only provided direction, it also provided protection. Protection, that's right. Because back in Exodus 14 then, when we were reading there, okay, if you kept your finger there, what did that pillar of fire and cloud do? Not only did it lead them, not only did it, when it got up and went, did they move that way, and clearly they, they followed it going out to the Red Sea, but what happened when they got to the Red Sea and the, and the Egyptian army showed up? Did, say again? It went behind them. It went from leading them to protecting their rear guard. You get it? Now, this is really incredible when you consider what happened here. Go back to verse 19. And, and honestly, I, I saw this. You know, you read and you prepare things, right? And, and you're writing things down and stuff like that. And then I read this again. And as I was reading this again, um, after I'd already made up the sermon note sheets and everything else, I saw something else, which is, I thought was really cool. Um, which I've divided it out. In verse 19, it says, The angel of God who went before the camp did what? It went behind him. And then the pillar of cloud went behind them. Now, I, I, this is not a profound moment for me because I already know this, but I never equated it back there in, in, in chapter 14. And that is, that we're going to see in a moment, Jesus Christ is the Shekinah Chabod of God. The Shekinah glory. The, the children of Israel would refer to this pillar of fire and pillar of cloud as the Shekinah of glory. The Shekinah glory of God. Okay, And they understood that it was the visible, physical representation of God in their midst. And so they would refer to him as, refer to it as the Shekinah glory of God. Okay, The Shekinah kabod. Okay, And so what we see here in chapter 14 is that the two words are used. Uh, synonymously, the angel of Yahweh moved, the angel of God moved behind them, but at the same time we're told what? The pillar of cloud. So who is the pillar of cloud? The angel of God. Do you see it? It's all one and the same. Now, so when they go behind it, look what else happens then. That when that, that pillar went behind them, it was to the one, the Egyptians, what? A wall of fire, but the fire gave what? Darkness. So, to the Egyptians, there was utter darkness. Do you get it? But what happened on the children of Israel side? They had light. So they could continue their preparations to move. And we're told that the Egyptians, now think about this, the Egyptians could not come near them. The Egyptians were an impressive army. They, they had great engineers. Think about it, they got the pyramids, right? They got the sphinxes. They got some of the world's greatest engineers at the time going on at that moment. What's a little dust storm to the Egyptians? Nothing. What's a cloud? What's a small little fog? Nothing. They charge through the fog. This pillar of fire and cloud must have been pretty impressive. Phyllis? Right. 
Right, they, they are left, just like in that, that, it has to be a shade of the, I'm going to mess this one up, the sixth commandment, I think. It was the sixth commandment, the darkness, or was it, was that the ninth? What I say? Commandment, plague, plague, thank you. Yes, do that for me. Anyways, so one of those plagues that, that came, remember it was darkness, the plague of darkness, but the children of Israel had what? Light. Do you mean, well, how could it be light in Goshen and, 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 and not light once one inch outside of Goshen? Do you ever wonder that? I mean, you know, like you're, you're, you're here in Goshen and all of a sudden you, you step across the boundary of Goshen and all of a sudden it's, oh, I can't see, I can't put my hand in front of me, but you take the step back and all of a sudden it's, wow, it's light. It's like, it's like you walk through a curtain. Yes, that multiplied. That's exactly right. It's the same concept, but there's still that transitional period where it's it's not just click click. It you got click and then there's uh, click, you know, and it's just amazing. And you just, but so there's it's almost like there was a curtain again that God placed down. And so I wonder that pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, you know, if it's even there during the times of the the plagues. And so yeah, exactly right. That that pillar has got to be massive, okay? And in the protection of it is to Against the Egyptian army, they had six hundred. Is that what I did? I read that right. Six hundred chariots, including horsemen. Because six hundred choice chariots, yeah. Okay, and, and and the rest of everything too. So I mean, they've got they brought out the best. They brought out the the, the top of their army after them. Okay, I mean, this is like telling you got the special forces and the rangers all out there, and they can't move. They're 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 hemmed down because of a. Pillar of cloud, because of darkness. I mean, think about it. When when would the rangers and when would the special forces like to do most of their maneuvering? At nighttime, but they couldn't. The Egyptians couldn't. They're they're stuck. They're stuck. Amazing thing. And so God God provided protection then through the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. In the same way, you would we would have had as we came through these things, we would have in that, that yellow little block. It would say the word of God provides protection. Okay, that God's word provides protection as well. Um, Ephesians chapter six, verses fourteen to seventeen. Does anybody know what that passage is all about? Ephesians six, verses fourteen to seventeen. You can look it up. It's the armor of God. Okay, and so we're told upon our, told to take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to what? Stand. I mean, again, the redundancy to what? What God wants us to do? He wants us to stand. Well, as we take up that armor of God and we have the belt of truth, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, in the life. Okay, and so truly, where do we get truth from? The word of God, okay? So, but we want it to be in truth. And so then everything else is being attached to that truth. And then if I have the truth, I have the, the breastplate of righteousness. Where does the breastplate of righteousness come from? Okay, but where does my righteousness come from? Jesus Christ, okay? So the truth comes from? Jesus Christ. The righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. I'm supposed to shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel, the good news of peace. Who is our peace? Jesus Christ. Okay, the good news of, the, the, of Jesus Christ bringing us peace with God. I'm supposed to take on the helmet of salvation. Where does that come from? Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm supposed to take the shield of faith. Okay, faith in what? Faith in Christ. And then above all, and then I'm supposed to take what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So do you get it? I mean, everything in that armor is all focused on who? Jesus Christ. Because we're told that Jesus Christ is who? The Word of God. Right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, without Him, without anything made, it was made. He is the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I want you to have that in your mind. We're getting ready to go to that passage. Okay? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so that Word of God provides me protection as well. And so we talked about it in Sunday school. Do you remember, for those who were here, we talked about the sword of the... God, the sword of the Lord, and how it brings bloodshed. And we talk about the fact that that's from the book of Isaiah. But the reality is the sword of the Lord is always for judgment. Okay? It's used for judgment. And so we use the, the word of God um, as, a, as a tool not only of defense, but also of offense, of judgment. Okay? People take, when we talk about I'm on the offense, people take that very offensively. <laughs> do, you get, do you get it? It's the same word. Okay? And why do they take it offensively? Because they're being cut. They're being, they're being cut by it. Okay? I was cut by it once. I'm glad I was. 
At some point, you were cut by someone telling you that you were what? A sinner. That you needed saved. You needed deliverance. Does that make sense? And so we have the, the Word of God is our, our source of um, protection as well. Now, in John chapter 1, we are told that in the beginning was the Word. The Word became flesh and what? Dwelt among us. Okay. In John chapter 8, turn with me there. In John chapter 8, Jesus says um, a pretty powerful statement. Now, you, we may read it and we don't get it. But to the, to the Jews, they got it. Okay? And we're going to talk about it now. We're going to talk about, first of all, the milieu of his statement. Okay? The, the context, what was going on at that time. And in John chapter 8, verse 12 is our, our, con, is our verse, but we're going to read this in, in context here. Start at verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and they had set her in the midst. Okay, So he goes on, and he deals with that issue about the woman um, caught in adultery. Verse 10, Okay, because we know that everybody winds up leaving, right? Verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman, and said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, my Lord. And he said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them, not to her, but to them. Who's them? All the people that were watching. Where is all this going on? In the temple. Okay, let me ask you one more question. When? Does anybody know when? When is this going on in the temple? Hmm, somebody find it for me. This is a, a, a Bible search. When is this going on? We know it's in the morning. Is there any special time that is going on? Feast of Tabernacles. How do you know, Matt? Good. Chapter 7, verse 2. Okay, The Feast of the Tabernacles is at hand. Okay, And so, this is a, an eight-day feast that the children of Israel would have. And Jesus is going early in the morning during this feast. Okay, Every day during the Feast of Tabernacles, they would add another sacrifice to, to it. And so they would start with one, then two, then three, then four. And they would work up to this high moment at the end of the, at the, end of the feast. Okay, And during that feast, they would have the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, This is remembering how God was with them in the wilderness. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles was all about. Okay? And they would make for themselves booths, and they would live in the booths, and they would remember how God delivered them through the wilderness. Okay? They would have, in the court of women, this great menorah. Does everybody know what a menorah is? Okay, this candelabra kind of thing, but it was a seven, a seven, um, uh, seven-stemmed menorah. Okay? And this great menorah would, would, shine, would, be, would be burning bright through the entire feast. Okay? And it was so bright, it was so great, it could be seen from all over the place. Okay? And one thing special about that great menorah is that that menorah was representative of the pillar of fire that led them through the wilderness. So Jesus is there in the court of women. How do I know he's in the court of women? That's where they brought the woman, caught in adultery. Okay? And so the, what's special about the court of women is not the court of the Gentiles. Okay, only Jews could come into that part. That's why the, that that menorah was there. Okay, and so, but you could go one step further into the holy place where only the men were allowed to go pray. So the court of women was where all the Jews could be. Okay, and that's why they would have the menorah there because all the all the Jews could celebrate that. And so Jesus is there, right by that great menorah, when he releases this woman, and he turns around and he turns to the people and says, "I." am the light of the whole world. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus takes the moment, at that very moment, he takes and he equates himself to that Shekhanah Chabod that Israel would have been, been looking to. The magnitude of the statement was, was huge. First of all, there was in the 
still thinking context as well, they would use at that time the term light, a light, to be the source of truth. And so um, you had the great light, which was God, but then you would have lesser lights, who were your rabbis. I would be a lesser light, you know, because I'm supposed to be what? Giving you insight and, and enlightening you to the truth of God, okay? So I would be considered, in a sense, a lesser light back then, okay? But Jesus says, he is the light. Do you get it? He's not just a light. He's not a light in the world. He's the light. He's capital L. He's the only light that's in the world. And those who follow him then will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But now to them, what's even more important, what I was driving at here, is that he is the Shekhinah Kabod. In John 1, then, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word, what, word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and everything was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, And then it says, he was in the world, the world was made by him, and without him, he was in the world, the world was made by him, but the world knew him not, right? And so he's now in the world, so we know that the, the word of God was God, that the world was made by God, and without him was not anything made that was made, so everything was made through him, and that he brings life and light to men. He was in the world. The world, though, didn't recognize him, and the world did what? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So he was rejected. And then we're told in verse 14 that the word became flesh and tabernacled. The word is dwelt, but again, that's written in Greek. The Hebrew equivalent in this passage would be to Shechan. He would be tabernacling among them. And then we're told that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And we beheld his glory. Jesus is the tabernacling glory of God. Do you get it? Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've what? You've seen the Father. We're told by Paul in the book of Colossians that in him the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. It's it's, it's an incredible thought process, but Jesus is called the icon of God, the form of God. The word is icon in the Greek. And so it's, it's kind of like having a, a, a hollow bust, if you would. Okay, And so you've got this form, but inside the form then, inside this bust, is the wholeness of, fullness of the Godhead jammed in there. I don't get it. As we've been looking at the shadow of Christ, we know that he's fully God, and yet he's fully what? Man. And so how do you get this man, this carcass? Of flesh. You know, there's one kind of flesh of the fish and one kind of flesh of man. Well, this is the flesh of man. This is no other kind of flesh. He didn't come in a, in a, in a heavenly flesh, in a heavenly body. He came and was encased as man. And yet we're told by Paul in Philippians chapter 2 that let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very morphe, the very form, the very nature God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because he was God, and took upon himself the form the outward likeness of a man and became obedient unto death. Isn't that incredible? The Word, who was God, who created all things, came into the world. He encased himself in flesh so that we could see the physical, visible representation of the glory of God on the earth. Do you want to know what the Shechanak abode, the glory of God, would look like on the earth? It would look like Jesus. So his statement then regarding himself is huge. Jesus was calling him first the source of truth. He was referring to himself as the Shekinah Kabod, the, the, the Shekinah glory of God. Now, if you're there, you're a Jew in that day, standing in the, the court of women. What did Jesus just say to you? Calling himself the light and the Shekinah glory of God. What did he just tell you? He's God. 
What did he just do? I mean, think context now. When did he make this statement? What did he just do? Right after he forgave the woman's sin. And not only did he forgive the woman's sin, what else did he do? It is a whole process of it. He convicted, he condemned, he judged everybody else. He acted as the what? The judge. Jesus Christ, in that moment, judged everyone. And as we're going to see in a moment, the light came into the world, and what did he do to the darkness? He revealed. He revealed the darkness. And everybody who was there, all those guys came with this woman. No, they didn't bring the guy. I mean, she was caught in the act of adultery, which means what? There were two. But they only brought the woman. Okay? And so, so Jesus gets down and writes on the earth, and there's always the debate, what did he write? Did he write the Ten Commandments? Did he draw arrows pointing to each person? Did he, did he write down different females' names that these guys had been with, or they, they had been lusting over? You know, did he just write down particular sins of these individuals? Did he write down their name as far as the book of, you know, did he draw a picture of the throne of God? You know, there's a lot of people, debate on what did Jesus scribble in the earth? Because clearly, he scribbled something. Does that make sense? And it made those guys what? Uncomfortable. They pondered. It made them, they wanted to leave. They wanted to get out of there, right? And so from the greatest to the least, then they, they left. From the oldest to the youngest, they left. Could you imagine if Jesus was in your midst? Now, I know that none of you do this. None of, none of you have done what those scribes and Pharisees have done. I've done it. You judge somebody because of their sin. They've done something that you found very what? Appalling. And so you judged them. You wanted God to judge them. You brought them before God. And you said, God, look at this. Now, you may not have physically dragged them in the, place, in the presence of God, but in your mind you did, right? You wanted them judged for it. What if Jesus, at that moment, would begin writing on the, the dirt of your heart? Because your heart is desperately wicked. And he begins to write on the dirt of your heart. The dirt of your heart. He does. That's exactly right. Have you ever had it happen? I have. Oh, yeah. And then it's like, oh, I am what? I am undone. I am undone. And that's what happened to these guys standing there that day. Because the light had come into their midst. But note what they don't do. What didn't they do? They didn't confess. They didn't confess. The only one left there was who? The woman. The woman. And he says, where's your accusers? She says, they're they're all gone. And this is a powerful statement. Then neither will I condemn you. Neither will I accuse you. Who's the accuser of the brethren? Satan. It's not Jesus. Do you get it? Jesus judges. Don't, don't forget that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. When I die, I'm going to stand before the bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm going to give an account for what I've done in the flesh. That has nothing to do with the white throne judgment. It has nothing to do whether I'm going to heaven or hell. But we're told as believers that when we die, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to give an account for what we've done in the flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says that those things which are made of uh, silver, gold, and precious stones will last, but that which is made of, of wood, hay, and stubble will what? Be burnt up. There will be the suffering of the loss of rewards. Remember, we are talking about that finance part, right? And those, those treasures that I was laying up on the earth, what's going to happen to them? They're all going to burn up. Those treasures I was laying up in heaven, what's going to happen? They're going to remain. Okay? So it's amazing what God's word does. It always comes back. Okay? And so Jesus is there, and he's that light. Okay? He's the Shekinah Kabod, the, the Shekinah glory of God, revealing what's going on in their hearts. Okay? Now, how does that apply then to us? Well, Jesus then says, those who follow him will not what? They're not going to walk in darkness. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. Those who follow Jesus, those who are, quote-unquote, his disciples, will not walk in in darkness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, 
and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Drop down now to um, chapter 5, verse 8. Now, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. We, as believers, are not supposed to have fellowship, a oneness, a camaraderie, a, 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 um, a symphony with darkness. You know what symphony means? It's one voice. Sim is with, in phone, voice, with one voice. And so there are uh, many words in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 when it says, what is light to do with Darkness, what is Christ to do with Belial, and what accord is there, da, da, da. And it uses all these different words of, of oneness, accord, and fellowship, and symphony. We shouldn't have one voice with those who are walking in darkness. Politics makes, finish it, strange bedfellows. God says you should not be shackled, you should not be yoked together with those who are of the dark. We've got to be careful how in the world we're becoming. Because your citizenship is not from here. Your citizenship is in, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, that they may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. That's where we're supposed to be living. That's where we're supposed to be dwelling. We're supposed to be having, setting our minds on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Not walking in the mire of the darkness of this world. 1 John chapter 1, we've memorized it, right, over the last couple of years. And it says that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. There is no darkness at all. Not even a little bit. There's not even a drop. The other day I was making the cake for Andrew. And, um, and you know, when I, when I do it, I decorate it. I, I love making different cakes. So this time it was a castle, okay? And so I made a, a castle for him. And, you know, we had, you know, cannonballs on it. They were... Milk balls, you know, melted milk balls. And um, we had fish in the moat because it was a blue plate. And so we put the little the sw- s- Swedish fish or sw- whatever they're called around it and stuff like that. Anyways, a lot of fun. But I started with what color icing? White. And what happened when I started to put that brown icing into it or the brown dye into it? It changed colors. And when I used the black to make the black wording, it changed. How much of a drop of brown or black dye did it take for that icing not to be white anymore? One. One. Now, I was painting. I finished my painting at somebody's house this past week as well. And at their house, they, the, where they live, everybody has to have their houses painted the same color. Okay? So they got gray for the walls, and they got a bluish gray for the trim. But then they've got this other gray for the panels of the door. So like when, you, when you're painting the, the trim part of the door, that's that bluish gray. But you look at it, and you would say, oh, that panel is white. It's not white. Because I watched them pour blue and black dye into it. And if I went to, to ask for more of that paint, I couldn't tell them, I just need another gallon of white paint. What I needed was white that was tinted, white that was soiled by the black and the blue that was put into it. Do you get it? It's not white paint. I didn't paint it white. To the naked eye, sometimes, we look at something and we say, what? The walls are what? They're white. They're not white. They're pink. It's a very, 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 very light pink, 
but there's red tint in that white. It's not pure white. Do you get it? But to us, we look at it and we say, oh, that's white. It's not white. Look back at the doors. Look, look the door is, is white. The trim of the door is white. Now, look at the wall. Is the wall white? No. No. Isn't it amazing? See, we look at the walls and we say, oh, the walls are white. But now when we see light, when we see white, we say, oh, it's not. Do you get it? God is what? Light. We look at man sometime and we think what? Oh, they're light. They're righteous. But when you hold yourself up or somebody else up to the light or the whiteness of God, guess what? It's filthy. It's filthy. That's why you do the white glove test. In him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we what? We lie and do not the truth. That's what God's word says. So, therefore, those who follow Jesus shall not walk in darkness. How much darkness? Any darkness. It should be your desire and my desire as a disciple of Jesus Christ that I will never and you will never walk in darkness, but you only walk in the light of his word. And then he says, those who follow him shall have the what? The light of life. You'll have the light of life. You'll have the opportunity, as we talk about with the word of God and stuff, you'll have the opportunity to have the light with you. You will be the possessor of light. Jesus said to those Jews who believed on him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. Jesus, we're told, again, is the what? He is the truth that has the light. He's the source of truth. He's the source of light. And so if you are a disciple of Christ and you're abiding in his word, and you're abiding in his word, then you will have that light. You'll have the light. You'll have the truth. And the truth, the light, will set you free. He also tells us, as we have on the sign today, that if you are in him, you are also what? The light of the world. You're supposed to be a reflector, a mirror. It's not your own light. But others should see the good works that you do and glorify who? Your Father. Why would they glorify the Father? Because, again, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, it's God who works in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. That God's light is the one that's working through you. And so you're just a reflector of the light. You're just a mirror of the light. Do you get it? And so as you go forth in it, you will be one who has the light and who's reflecting it to those in the world. Drawing them where? To the light. To the Father. To the light. And so the question is for you and I, who or what are we looking to as a source of our truth? Christ of the world. I mean, honestly, again, going back to the, the finances and stuff like that, do you honestly take time to search the scriptures daily to find out what God's will for you is? Do you know what God's word says about finances? You ought to. What about how you should work? How about if you're an employer, how you should treat your employees? All these things are in God's word. He is the source of truth in all things. Not just in theological things, but in all things. What or who are you looking to for your provision and protection? Christ or the world? God continually worked through the nation of Israel. And we're going to see this even next week as we look at Jesus being the, the living water. Israel continued to do what throughout the wilderness? Say again? Follow the, yeah, but they continue to whine. They continue to whine. They continue to complain. And what do they whine and complain about? The, the provision of God. You know, oh, we have no water. You brought us out here to die. Oh, we don't have any meat. Oh, you know, oh, we don't have any bread. Oh, we don't, have, oh, we don't. Have. Sure sounds like Bob a lot sometimes, you know. I, I've whined. I mean, I've shared some of my wine with you. You know, I didn't give you any cheese with the wine, but I gave you, I gave you the wine. You know, numerous times I've talked about, you know, by this point I thought I would be what? Oh, no, full time. And so, yeah, I thought I'd be over it. Yeah. And, uh, get over it, Bob. And, uh, but, uh, but the fact is that, I mean, I'm, I just share honestly with you, but that I'm sharing with you because I know that it, there are times in my, in my walk with the Lord that I've what? 
I've questioned God's what? Direction and protection. Yeah, his leadership in my life. Okay? And we've got to, to, to look and say, made a decision, who is my provider? Who is my protector? It is Christ alone. He is the light of the world. So what is your life characterized by? Is it light or darkness? Are you reflecting the light of the world? Or the light of life? I didn't think about this before. I just What made me stop here for a moment, this is kind of fun, because sometimes what I have on the computer is not exactly what I have on the screen. Look back. You can see the computer from here. Can you see the wording back there? What color is the top part? Blue, gray. What's it look like up there? Almost, almost white, huh? Now, what's the, what's the bottom one back there? That looks like white. Does it look like white from your, where you're at, Ben? There are two different shades. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, see? And the top one has a blue tint to it. It has a bluish-gray tint to it, and the bottom has a little bit of yellowish tint to it. <laughs> Anyways, it's kind of fun, okay? So the fact is, what light are you following? There are two different colors. Yeah, isn't that funny? It's, it's perceptible sometimes, two different colors. Whose light are you following? Who is the light of your life? We're going to get ready to have communion. In it, communion, again, we're told that Passover celebration that we talked about last week. Remember, I challenged you last week that as we look toward um, Passover, toward, or toward communion this week, that you should take some time to prepare this week, considering the blood of Christ and what he's done for you and how he's led you from Egypt. Well, I want to challenge you again, like I did last week. Here we have the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire that's going off before Egypt. He takes them all the way you know, to the Red Sea. They, they haven't gone but a day outside of Egypt, quote-unquote, right? And what do the children of Israel start doing? Grumbling. Grumbling. We should have stayed there. We should have stayed there. <laughs> Folks, listen to me for a second. What was there in their midst when they started grumbling? The Shekinah glory of God, the Shekinah kabod, the pillar of fire was there. Remember, it went from before them to behind them. So when Egypt came, they had that presence of God in their midst. Do you get it? The power of God was there. And they looked at the power of God, the light of God, and they looked at the power of Egypt, and they said what? Oh man, we're, we're, we're wasted. We're, dead. we're toast. They're, they're, they're killing us. So it moves behind them. And it protects them. And we're told that God still tells Moses what? Quit whining. And watch me do my mighty work. So even when God moved behind them to protect them, the children of Israel still what? They still doubted. That's sin. Friend? That's exactly right. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. And, 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 but we're called out of that. And so many times we, though, take it with us, don't we? we take, and that's why Romans 12, 2 says, not be conformed to the world, but rather be transformed in the renewing of your mind. So you, what, think a different way. You think the way Christ wants you to think. So now we come up to communion, and I ask you, how are you thinking? Have you spent time preparing yourself before him? God says through Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that some are sick and some are even dying because they're eating and drinking of this time unworthily. Now, I don't want to make it into this mystical thing more than it is, but it is important. God placed a significance upon the time that we come together in what's called communion. When we have fellowship with him and fellowship with one another, declaring that we have a oneness with him. If there is sin within you, if the light of life, the light of the world, has revealed in you some darkness, we're going to take some time now to pray. I pray that you would give that to him and confess that. We'll sing the light of the world, um, hear him the worship when we're done. Okay? I'll come up and I'll close this prayer. Let's pray.